Before I begin today, I want to say a couple words of thank you. First, I want to thank all of you. Uh, as I was standing in the narthex this morning, um, you all came in and introduced yourself and welcomed me, and so I thank you for that welcome. Uh, I know she's not here this morning, but I hope that this word will reach um, Kara. I want to thank her for helping to get us all organized and uh, preparing the bulletin and answering all my questions that I had last week. I want to thank our musician and our liturgists who have served this morning to lead us in worship. And finally, I do want to thank Terry, Pastor Terry, who's been such an important part of my ministry. You all are exceedingly blessed to have such a talented and brilliant pastor. And I pray that you have and continue to make the most of your time together. As I start my sermon this morning, I'd like to begin with a meditation by Howard Thurman titled, The Work of Christmas. The Work of Christmas. When the songs of the angel, angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and the princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, to make music in the heart. I know Christmas ended weeks ago, and last Sunday was Epiphany, which isn't technically Christmas, but in my experience, Epiphany always has that Christmas feeling to it. I don't know what you all had last week, um, but at my church, for example, I preached on the visit of the Magi, and so we still had that image of the baby Jesus in the manger and the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, and to quote Howard Thurman, the star was still in the sky as they followed it to the Christ child. The hymns were also Christmassy. We sang, We Three Kings, There's a Song in the Air, and the First Noel. This week, however, it's undeniable that Christmas, the Christmas holiday and its adjacent celebrations are behind us, making Howard Thurman's words undeniably appropriate for our hearing this morning. In the work of Christmas, Thurman reminds us that the newborn baby Jesus was born to us for a purpose. Jesus Christ came to transform our world into a more compassionate, more just, more forgiving place. What Thurman describes as the work of Christmas is the work that Christ fulfilled in his ministry. And so, it is the work of all Christians, you and me, the whole year round. You and I have inherited that high calling to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among us, and to make music in the heart. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Mark, which is the only one of the four Gospels that does not devote any time to explaining where it is Jesus came from, this work that he's going to be about is depicted as being quite urgent. If you look at the sermon title, you'll no doubt recognize that it's taken right from the text itself. All action in this first chapter of Mark happens either at once, right away, or at that very moment. In Mark, there's no time to spare. These same phrases continue throughout Mark's gospel, and no doubt his intention was to remind his readers that the world's needs are so great that Jesus began his work right away without delay. We should feel at home in Mark's gospel. 
because we're no strangers to urgency. For example, the 495 Beltway. Anybody ever been on the 495 Beltway? I knew it. Nervous laughter always, always tells. It runs right through the county that I live in. And that means that local news reports on traffic patterns at least every hour. And so every hour, a sense of urgency underlies the news updates. On most mornings, traffic runs at a steady pace in one direction down the country road that I live on. In my area, distance is measured in time. And the sooner you can get to one, from point A to point B, the better. Even if you don't live in an urban population or urban area, you're still familiar with a sense of urgency and hurry and instant gratification. For example, we just finished one of the most hectic seasons of the year where our schedules were likely overfull and we stretched ourselves thin so that we could participate in all the meaningful events of the Christmas season. Anybody do that? Anybody have a full schedule? Yeah. During that time between Thanksgiving and Christmas, businesses capitalized on how fast they could get packages to your home. An article I read that was written on December 16th, 2023, said that the United States Postal Service had already delivered over 8 billion packages by that date. 8 billion packages, Christmas season packages by that date. And that was written on December 16th. And they also shared how many Amazon delivered. Anybody got a guess how many Amazon delivered? If you had to say, who thinks it's more? Okay, who thinks it's less? Okay, you can't not vote. Okay, I see a lot of people not voting. Amazon delivered a measly five billion compared to the United States Postal Service. And I confess that I was surprised by how fast many of my orders were delivered. Some of them arrived before the estimated ar arrival date. That happened to anybody else? Yeah. But as the season went on, my satisfaction started to wane a little bit because we started getting closer to Christmas and I had to wait a week. A week. Now, 10 years ago, waiting a week would have been quite normal. Urgency and speed is taken for granted in our culture where most everything is done quickly. Information is readily accessible as well. We could do a quick Google search and find the answer to our questions in no time at all, which only reinforces our addiction to instant gratification. The Gospel of Mark, with its urgent tempo, was written for a time like ours. It's written for our fast-paced world. Still, the urgency of Mark, at once, right away, at that very moment, exposes an irony. That we live in a fast-paced world that should be at home in the Gospel of Mark, but the church of the 21st century is known as an institution with a stagnation problem. An article I read recently by author and church leadership expert Carrie Newwolf listed some problems facing churches today. And one of those problems, he says, is that churches are often afraid to risk what is for the sake of what might be. They're afraid to risk what is for the sake of what might be. Another problem is kind of similar, is that many churches are in love with the past. 
Essentially, New Wolf is saying that while the rest of the world is moving at lightning speed at once, right away, at that very moment, the community of Jesus' disciples is spinning its wheels. In our own time, today, the needs of the world are urgent. And the church has much to offer through its witness to the strong love of God and its ministries to the vulnerable. What are we waiting on? What are we waiting on? In my time as a pastor, I've learned that more often than not, churches, are, all churches, are usually, if they're waiting, they're waiting for three things. More people, more money, and different leadership. If I'm completely honest, pastors are not immune to this desire for more. And so, by faith, we have to trust that the Spirit of God has not left us with insufficient funds. By faith, we have to trust that in our baptism, the Spirit has given us the gifts sufficient to the calling we've received. Pay attention to how Jesus started his own urgently needed ministry. After Jesus departed from the wilderness to begin his ministry, he called a small group of disciples. Jesus didn't need a large community of followers. And if he didn't need a large community of followers then, I don't think he needs a large community of followers now. And yet, how much more could he do with us? What's even more surprising is that Jesus called ordinary people, like fishermen and laborers. He called people like, well, I'm, I'm assuming that you're ordinary, but he called people like you and me, ordinary people. And so dare to believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, God will equip you for the calling. There's a saying, God doesn't call the equipped, God equips the called. Jesus began his ministry at once, right away, at that very moment. And neither Jesus nor his disciples were wealthy, from what I can tell. His ministry was supported by the community. He didn't wait for a, a treasury. He didn't wait to have a budget surplus. The needs were too urgent. What I'm saying is this. We have what we need for meaningful ministry and mission. John the Baptist says that Jesus will give us an even greater baptism, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've received the Holy Spirit in our baptism. What else could we possibly need? Each one of us is here because the grace of God through the Holy Spirit has called us to the way of Jesus Christ and I hope that Mark's sense of urgency is not lost on us. In a previous appointment, the church I served had a feeding ministry. And this ministry that served food was open to any member of the community that wanted to come. Regardless of income, people could come on the first and third Friday of the month from 4.30 to 6 for a hot meal to go. You didn't even have to get out of your car. People pulled up in anything from old, worn out cars to brand new Priuses. We served them all equally. And sometimes that was hard. It, it was hard, at least for me, to justify serving the family with five kids and a 15 year old rusty car the same as the man in a new Prius. But over time, we discovered 
how urgently and desperately most people that came needed the ministry. Some, like the family with five kids, needed the meals because they were financially insecure. Others, like the man in the Prius, needed company and spiritual support. This man came through and asked for prayers for his sick wife with cancer. He wasn't a member of any congregation in the community. But through our ministry, he was able to get some form of spiritual support from a church community. He didn't go to church, but we became his church. I know all y'all know that song, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. That became embodied through our ministry to that man. We became his church. The ministry fed the hungry, and it helped the lost. We served this meal 24 times a year and averaged 125 meals each time. 125 meals each time. And I want to go back to what I said about what are we waiting for? Churches want more. Pastors want more. And I confess that as pastor, I always wanted to get more people from the church involved in this ministry. But at most, only 10 people were involved at any one time. Not all of them were young either. I was probably the youngest participant. The person who was responsible for most of the cooking was in her 80s. It's not just the young. It's not the most gifted. It's not the most able-bodied or the smartest who are called to ministry. All of us are called. Meaningful ministry can happen when two or three or more people gather with the intention of living and serving and witnessing to the kingdom of God. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, to make music in the heart. Let it be so at once, right away, at this very moment. Amen.